just laying there minding my own business, and then, pow! The hatch went, I looked up, and I saw nothing but blue sky and water starting to come in over the sill. So I popped my helmet off, and the only two moves I remember making was popping my helmet off and grabbing the uh, instrument panel and pulling myself out. In the early days of the space race, Project Mercury solved a lot of the mysteries surrounding manned spaceflight, but it also generated a mystery of its own, a mystery that still lingers to this day. What caused the explosive hatch on Liberty Bell 7 to open? To try and shed some light on this, I will talk about the aftermath of the mission, including the testing and the effect on Gus Grissom's career. I will also go through some of the leading theories. As part of this, I will present information that casts some doubt on the most commonly quoted evidence used to prove that Grissom was innocent. With a major piece of evidence resting on the floor of the Atlantic Ocean, the experts set out about trying to unravel the mystery by conducting a series of comprehensive tests. The hatch that formed part of the pressure vessel that maintained the cockpit's environment was held in place by 70 titanium bolts. Although often described as explosive bolts, they did not contain a pyrotechnic charge. Instead, they had small holes drilled into them to give them a point of weakness that allowed them to fail when a certain amount of pressure was applied to them. To create this pressure, an explosive charge called a mild detonating fuse, or MDF, placed between the inner and outer hatch seals was detonated. The igniter assembly that detonated the MDF was comprised of a plunger inside the cockpit that when pushed inwards allowed two spring-loaded firing pins to hit detonator percussion caps. To protect the exterior of the hatch, a layer of black shingles was attached over it and held in place by more bolts. Also on the exterior, there was a release handle on the end of a cable that could be pulled to detonate the MDF from the outside. Over several months, all the various components were tested to try and find an answer. The MDF was subjected to standalone tests, including exposing it to static discharges and impacts, but nothing caused an accidental detonation to occur. The percussion caps were also subjected to similar various standalone tests, with the same results. The experts also put an igniter assembly with MDF installed through a simulated spaceflight. They exposed it to vacuum, the temperature of re-entry, a saline solution and various levels of vibration. They also subjected it to repeated electrostatic shocks. Nothing caused an accidental detonation. Following these tests, the MDF was detonated by pulling the external release handle to show that the igniter assembly still worked. The experts also carried out push tests on the plunger to determine how much pressure needed to be applied to depress it under various conditions. Using an igniter assembly without MDF installed, they put the system through its paces, including tests without any O-ring in place and also with the safety pin removed. The test condition that required the least amount of force to depress the plunger was then subjected to various levels of vibration. Nothing the experts did could make the plunger move without a certain amount of force being applied to it. All of this showed that under these test parameters, the explosive devices, either on their own or installed in an igniter assembly, would not detonate accidentally. They also showed that the plunger would not move under its own volition. The experts' verdict, it just wasn't possible as far as they were concerned for the hatch to blow without human interaction. Using the experts' findings as a source for scepticism against Grissom's denials of any involvement, Tom Wolfe wrote in his book, The Right Stuff, Nobody was about to accuse Gus of anything, but the engineers kept rolling their eyes at each other. So what's the truth? Is it possible that this mystery will ever be solved? There are a number of theories about what happened, so let's take a look at them, including the most likely solution and also the most controversial of them all. This theory involves the external method for detonating the MDF. Gunter Vent, the launchpad leader who worked closely with the astronauts, wrote in his book, The Unbroken Chain, there is one theory that makes the most sense to me. My own suspicion involves the second method for blowing the hatch, the external lanyard. I believe the lanyard may have gotten free of its compartment on splashdown. Vent speculates that the lanyard could have become entangled with the spacecraft's deployed landing bag and activated the explosive device. The most likely cause of this entanglement was one of the landing bag straps that can be seen in this photo of Sigma-7 on the recovery ship. Another similar theory put forward is that the lanyard somehow got tangled up in the line that kept the marker die next to the spacecraft. This line that ran from the top of the spacecraft is visible in this photo from John Glenn's recovery. It had caused Grissom some problems after he had entered the water, as he later recalled. 
I got entangled in the line, which attaches a die marker package to the capsule. Others have speculated whether the lanyard could have somehow become entangled with a parachute shroud line. The problem with any theory involving the lanyard is that there was no lanyard on Liberty Bell 7 when it splashed down. There was an exterior hatch release handle in a small indented space on the hatch, which was attached to a cable that was stored behind the black protective shingles. To expose the cable, the handle had to be pulled outwards. During the operation of the exterior method for detonating the explosive hatch, a lanyard could be attached to the release cable, but this was only after divers were in situ or the spacecraft was on the deck of the recovery ship. As can be seen in this video, the white line is the lanyard, which when pulled on, pulls out the release cable. Could the release cable have become entangled? The release cable they would use to detonate the explosive bolts to jettison the hatch off was only 42 inches long. So whether this was long enough for it to become entangled with the straps of the landing bag is debatable. It is also highly unlikely that this cable would have become exposed because it required someone to pull on the handle to do so. Rent would state, it is the most logical explanation. Can we prove it? No. In reality, the lanyard theory is a non-starter because there was no lanyard. Another theory relates to the design of the titanium bolts that locked the hatch in place and the fact that they had a point of weakness that caused them to fail when a certain level of tension was applied to them. After Liberty Bell 7 was recovered in 1999, it was discovered that a strip of titanium had been buckled around the hatch and that the hatch sill had been bowed about a half inch. It's assumed that the most likely cause for this was the force with which the spacecraft splashed down. Grissom had recalled that he had felt a good bump had splashed down. Greg Buck Buckingham, who had been part of the restoration team at the Kansas Cosmosphere and Space Center theorized that Liberty Bell 7 slammed hatch down into the Atlantic, buckling the titanium strip and popping the 70 explosive rigged bolts on the convex hatch one by one. Most telltale to me is a lack of burn marks. Kurt Newport, the salvage expert who raised the spacecraft said, that's a lot of deflection. If the hatch was blown, it would have sort of been somewhat uniform. There are a lot of problems with this theory. First of all, it implies that the force upon splashdown caused damage to the spacecraft that didn't immediately lead to the bolts failing, but caused them to fail one by one over time until the hatch came off. If the damage was indeed caused at splashdown, what conditions could have caused the bolts to fail, but not at the point at which the damage was caused? Also, if this theory is correct, the initial damage would have had to have weakened all of the bolts because if any of the bolts weren't weakened then why would they break although the spacecraft was bobbing around in the water would this have been enough to make the bolts fail it is also recorded that the hatch flew several feet across the ocean something that occurred when the mdf was detonated if the bolts had merely broken one by one then the hatch would have just dropped into the ocean when the final bolt failed in regards to the lack of burn marks exposure to 38 years of seawater could have washed them away, similar to how a good soak will clean a burnt frying pan, especially as salt is a great way of removing scorch marks. Finally, there is Grissom's description. Just laying there minding my own business and then pow! A hatchman, I looked up and I saw nothing but blue sky and water starting to come in over the sill. With this theory, the evidence seems to imply that the hatch failure was an instantaneous occurrence where all of the bolts failed simultaneously due to the explosive device detonating. If, as the expert stated, there was no way to make the hatch jettison on its own by accident, is it possible that Grissom could have accidentally knocked the plunger? There were three things inside the copy that day that are quoted as possibly having done this. The first of these is a part of Grissom himself. During the mission debriefing, he had conceded that, I had the cap off and the pin out, but I don't think that I hit the button. The capsule was rocking around a little bit, but there weren't any loose items in the capsule so I don't see how I could have hit it. Possibly I did. Deke Slayton wrote in his book Deke. He told me sure, there was a possibility he had banged the thing by mistake. There wasn't a lot of room inside Liberty Bell 7 and it was sloshing around on the water, something fierce. So could he have hit it with a part of his body and not known about it? This is unlikely because the pressure produced to cause the bolts to fail also produced a recoil on the plunger that was strong enough to cause bruises on hands, cuts in gloves that were reinforced with metal, and even cracked the window on Gordon Cooper's Faith 7 spacecraft when its hatch was jettisoned on the recovery ship. Secondly, as we can see in this image of Grissom, it is clear that his head and shoulders were both well below the bottom of the hatch sill, 
so it is hard to see how either could have accidentally come into contact with the plunger. Grissom would state after the mission, We tried for weeks afterwards to find out what had happened and how it had happened. I even crawled into capsules and tried to duplicate all of my movements to see if I could make the same thing happen again, but it was impossible. The plunger that detonates the bolts is so far out of the way that I would have had to reach for it on purpose to hit it, and this I did not do. Even when I thrashed about with my elbows, I could not bump against it accidentally. The second thing was Grissom's spacesuit helmet. Some have speculated that this may have knocked the plunger in the confined space of the cockpit. Walt Williams, the Project Mercury Operations Director, was one of those who thought this, stating, I never believed that he panicked and jettisoned the hatch. I do believe, however, that it's very possible he bumped the switch by accident with the helmet. So did the spacesuit helmet hit the plunger either while Grissom was wearing it and moving around, or after he had took it off and was holding it as the spacecraft bobbed around in the water? The problem with this theory is that such an accidental collision between spacesuit helmet and plunger would have only occurred while Grissom was wearing it. Grissom did not take his space helmet off because he needed to keep it on right up until the last moment before exiting the spacecraft because it had the earphones and microphones built into it. We know that Grissom was wearing his helmet right before the hatch jettisoned because he said to the helicopter crew, If he had removed the helmet any earlier, he wouldn't have been able to receive the instruction to blow the hatch and exit. In fact, removing his helmet would be the last thing he did inside his spacecraft. As he later stated, I lifted the helmet from my head and dropped it reached to the right side of the instrument panel and pulled myself through the hatch. Therefore, if such a collision had taken place, it would surely have been felt by Grissom because it required around five pounds of force to depress the plunger and because of its powerful recoil. The third item was the Randall Astro Knife. Perhaps the only other item that could have accidentally come into contact with the plunger was the survival knife. In regards to this knife, Grissom stated that following splashdown, he had removed it from the hatch and placed it in the bag containing his survival kit. Could he have accidentally hit the plunger with it? This theory can be dispelled, because if he had hit the plunger with the knife while transferring it to his survival kit bag, then the hatch would have blown and he wouldn't have had time to put it in the bag. Unfortunately for Grissom, when he later said that he had been thinking about retrieving the knife as a souvenir while he was waiting for the helicopter to attach a recovery line to the spacecraft, it opened the door for people to accuse him of accidentally hitting the plunger. Tom Wolf wrote, but what about the business of the knife? He said he wanted to take the knife as a souvenir. So he may have been trying to fish the knife out of the survival kit. Did Grissom accidentally hit the plunger while he was reaching for the knife? We only have his word that he didn't. Another theory put forward is outlined in The Race by James Schefter. It theorizes that Grissom had gotten so excited after his quick space flight that he automatically removed the cap, pulled the safety pin and blew it all in one continuous, highly trained reflex. Bob Thompson of the Recovery Operations Branch stated, As far as I'm concerned, the problem was Gus got out of sequence. The procedures were, he was supposed to stay there and not activate either of those safety devices until the helicopter told him he had 1,800 revs per minute, which gave him above the water. Then he was supposed to take the cap off, pull the pin, slide the plunger in, blow the door, sit on the sill and go out. Grissom had admitted to getting ahead of himself in the hatch jettisoning procedure, so it is possible that the pressing of the plunger was a reflex action as part of one swift process he had trained to do. Walt Williams said, I felt there was too much emphasis on procedures and not enough on the systems. If he'd have trained to think of the system as opposed to a set of steps, he would probably have waited until the last possible second to take the safety pin out of the hatch. Grissom did admit that he felt he hadn't had much time to train for his mission and hadn't covered certain parts of the mission as in depth as he would have liked to have done. In Wii 7, Grissom noted, I did not get to spend much time with my spacecraft until after Shepard's flight. It should be remembered that Shepard's spacecraft did not have the explosive hatch. Grissom added, Things moved so fast, however, that I did not get to do quite all of the things I wanted to do before the flight. I also feel now that it is all over, that I could have used more training in recovery procedures at sea. Something reiterated in the post-flight report that noted that Grissom had felt least well prepared in the recovery portion of the mission. Dr. Robert Vos said of the new hatch, It had been developed so rapidly that there had not been much time to train on it, or to test it. 
could Grissom have robotically depressed the plunger because of a lack of training and because he was thinking of the hatch jettisoning process as one single action. There's no question that NASA wouldn't have sent Grissom on a space flight if they felt he wasn't fully trained and he had indeed witnessed a test firing of the hatch. The problem with any of these theories involving the hatch blowing by accident is that Grissom denied any knowledge of or involvement in the jettisoning of the hatch until the day he died. This means that for any of these accidental theories to be true, he would have had to have lied and covered up what he had done. Wolf wrote that this was the natural instinct of a pilot who had messed up. There, Gus, old boy. You showed the instincts of a true fighter jock. After you've done some forbidden hassling, and your ship flames out, and you have to eject, and your F-100 goes kaboom on the desert floor, naturally you come back to base and say, I don't know what happened, sir. Wolf would write of Grissom's denial. I was lying there, and it just blew. Oh, that was rich. So would Grissom really have owned up and taken the blame, knowing that he could possibly end any chance he had of another space flight? An incident in 1971 possibly provides an answer to this. Gene Cernan recalls in his book, Last Man on the Moon, how he crashed a training helicopter into a river. Facing his boss, Deke Slayton, Cernan says that he told it as it was. The crash was his fault. He claims that Slayton gave him a way out by suggesting that it was engine trouble, but Cernan maintained that it was his fault, knowing full well that it could mean he lost any chance of walking on the moon. He wrote, by telling the truth to Deke, had I dashed my chances to fly Apollo 17. Grissom wasn't Cernan, but it does add weight to what Gordon Cooper noted in his book, Leap of Faith. I knew that if he had screwed up, Gus would have been the first to admit it. A sentiment backed up by Grissom's younger brother Lowell, who stated, If Gus said he didn't do it, he didn't do it. This theory is the most controversial because it blames the space pilot. It is also the theory that makes the least sense because for it to be true, it would mean that Grissom abandoned a tried and tested method of recovery and exited a perfectly safe spacecraft to risk drowning in the swell of the Atlantic Ocean. What could have caused him to do such a thing? Some have put it down to him panicking because he thought that the spacecraft was sinking. This theory is most notoriously implied by Philip Kaufman's film, The Right Stuff, which portrays him as a squirming hatch blower. In the film, Grissom is shown post splashdown, sweating profusely, breathing heavily and frantically struggling to undo his helmet. He is shown to be in a state of some anxiety at being in the confined space of the cockpit, hearing strange noises and seeing water lapping around the window. While the film may imply it, the book by Tom Wolfe, on which the film is based, is just outright blatant about accusing Grissom. In regards to Grissom's physical condition, Wolfe seems to imply in his book that Grissom was scared even before he had launched, writing, Judging by his pulse rate and respiration, Gus was more nervous than Shepard during the countdown. Wolfe would also say of Grissom, His pulse stayed up around 150 throughout the five minutes he was weightless. Shepard's pulse had never reached 140, not even during liftoff. On responsibility for the hatch opening, Wolf was unambiguous, writing, He had blown the hatch before the lead helicopter could hook on. Despite Wolf painting Grissom as being panicky, the reason he puts forward for the hatch being blown is accidental. Wolf wrote, It was doubtful that he had hit the detonator on purpose. Instead, he speculated that Grissom had been reaching for the knife and wrote, the capsule is rocking in the swells. He bangs into the detonator. That's all it would have taken. Oh, there was no question that he had hit the damn button some way. Once in the water, Wolf would state that Grissom was filled with sheer panic. As to his state of mind, Wolf made a big deal out of Grissom putting on a life preserver in the helicopter during the flight to the recovery ship. He wrote that the helicopter crew could see that he was in a bad way. He looked funny. He was gasping for breath and he was shaking. His eyes kept darting around. He found what he was looking for, a Mae West, a life preserver. Wolf continued. He obviously thought they were going to crash at any moment. He thought he was going to drown. He gasped. He battled the Mae West all the way back to the carrier. So is there any evidence to support this version of events? Before the flight, Grissom had said, I know I'm going to be scared when I get in the capsule, but I don't worry about being scared. During the Mercury flights, his heartbeat during launch was the highest of any of the astronauts. It was also the highest during the weightless portion of the flight, 
and was the second highest heartbeat during a Mercury re-entry, the highest being Gordon Cooper's during his problematic return to Earth. Following splashdown, Grissom stated, the window was covered completely with water and there was a disconcerting gurgling noise. In addition to this, unlike Alan Shepard, Grissom was not invited to the White House after his space flight to receive a medal from the President. Some saw this as an indication that Grissom was being held responsible for the loss of the spacecraft. So is there any truth to the theory that he was spooked and jettisoned the hatch because he panicked? There is in fact a lot of evidence against this, the most compelling of which is the fact that Grissom actually told the helicopter crew to hold off so that he could have more time inside the spacecraft before being recovered, so that he could complete his post splashdown tasks. This directly contradicts the image of a panicked pilot who just wanted to get out. As well as this, listening to the voice communications clearly shows that Grissom was calm, almost matter of fact, as he went about his post splashdown tasks. I have actuated the rescue aids. Uh, the reserve chute has jettisoned. In fact, I can see it in the water, I think. See something around the water. And the whip antenna should be up. As James Lewis, the pilot of the Prime Recovery Helicopter stated, All our voices were calm. We had rehearsed these procedures and activities. There was no reason not to be calm. Further proof of Grissom's professional behaviour came in the post-flight notes he made of the dials and switch settings on the control panel. I have a report coming from the recovery forces that as a result of communications with Gus Grissom floating in the water, he's told his recovery helicopters that he intends to finish his checklist and make sure that everything is secure in the cockpit before he opens the hatch to come out. And this sounds like typical Gus Grissom. He was not about to do anything until he was sure everything had been done and in a business-like manner. His notes, made with a special grease pencil, were, according to the team that restored the spacecraft after its recovery in 1999, still visible on the recovered checklist. Grissom's brother Lowell said, he was actually there, getting his readings. That to me doesn't lend itself to be panicky if you're doing something like that. To counter the reasons for Grissom panicking in the film, the right stuff, let's compare fiction to fact. Did the strange gurgling noises spook him? Grissom's comments would seem to dispel this. He merely said, I made a quick check and could see no sign of water leaking in. In regards to his psychological condition, the pre-flight psychiatric examination revealed no evidence of overt anxiety. Wolf's interpretation of the medical data is a misrepresentation because it was a known fact by the medical team that Grissom's heart rate was a little higher than his colleagues. Of the selection process testing, Grissom noted, the only one that I did not do too well on was the treadmill. My heartbeat went up to 200 beats per minute before the doctors stopped the test. As for his sweating, this was simply a result of him overheating because he had disconnected the inlet hose that supplied the cooling air that circulated around his spacesuit. This leads to the conclusion that Grissom's physical condition, his increased heart rate, his sweating, and his eye respiration rate wasn't a display of panic. Any claims of claustrophobia can also be dispelled because he had carried out hours of training in the spacecraft and so was perfectly at home in there as he stated, having spent so much time in the cockpit I felt it was normal to be there. He had also endured isolation tests during which he joked that he had gotten three or four hours sleep. As to his state of mind during the helicopter flight to the recovery ship, Grissom said, as soon as I got into the helicopter, my first thought was to get a life preserver so that if anything happened to the helicopter, I wouldn't have another ordeal in the water. Was this a sign of panic or the understandable reaction of a man who had just come frighteningly close to drowning? Regarding the comments he made about being scared, Grissom stated that, if a guy isn't a little frightened by a trip into space, he's abnormal. A statement backed up by Christopher Kraft, who said, if he wasn't somewhat afraid, he didn't understand the problem, and Grissom understood the problem. In connection with what happened after the flight and the apparent snub, he did receive the NASA Distinguished Service Medal, albeit at Cape Canaveral, by NASA Administrator James Webb. Although there was no invite to the White House, others, such as Gordon Cooper, noted that this would have been the case for anyone flying the somewhat anticlimactic second suborbital flight. Finally, there is the fact that during the post-flight physical examination, 
there was no visible injuries found on any part of his body that could have struck the plunger. When considering the portrayal of Grissom in the film The Right Stuff, it should be remembered that it is a film for entertainment and not a factual documentary, as borne out by the fact that it uses a Gemini spacecraft for the splashdown sequence. Along with all the evidence against Grissom being in a panic, there is one final point to take into consideration, the character of the man himself. During the Korean War, Grissom had flown 100 combat missions and when his tour of duty ended, he asked to be allowed to stay and fly more missions. Of his time going up against MiG fighters, Grissom said, I decided that spaceflight could not be more dangerous than that. You get used to handling yourself in a situation like this, when death is supposedly knocking at your door. You are scared, but you learn to take care of yourself. As his younger brother Norman said, anybody who ever knew him or met him wouldn't consider he panicked. Of all the theories out there, this one has three main factors behind it that point to it being the actual cause of the arch jettisoning. Firstly, it is a known fact that a helicopter in flight can build up an electrostatic charge. This post clearly shows that contact with a helicopter or anything attached to a helicopter in flight can produce a shock, so safety precautions are needed. The US military use a static probe and insulating gloves to discharge static electricity from helicopters before attaching any cargo. This video shows what happens when no such precautions are taken. This was known before the flight of Mercury 4 and was even the focus of a prank played on a NASA aeronautical research engineer by the US Marines involved in the recovery training. Peter Armitage relates how they gave me the electronic tree pruning device in my hands. As soon as I touched the thing to the antenna, my hands went up like that. There's a big static shock. Secondly, NASA were aware that certain pyrotechnics were subject to unplanned detonation due to electrostatic discharge. The third factor relates to the recovery process. Before securing a recovery line to the spacecraft, the helicopter crewman was tasked with cutting off the high frequency recovery antenna on top of the spacecraft so that it would not obstruct the helicopter. The man responsible for doing this for Mercury 4 was Lieutenant John Reynard, and he stated, When I touched the antenna, there was an arc. At the same time, the hatch came off. It is compelling evidence that it was a simultaneous event. The cutter came into contact with the antenna, an arc was observed, and the hatch was jettisoned. In addition to this, the cutter he was using had two explosive squibs, both of which detonated by accident at the same time. When all of this information is put together, it does seem that an electrostatic arc is the most probable cause of the loss of Liberty Bell 7. On the flip side of this, of course, there is the evidence of the post-flight tests carried out that did involve the application of a static charge, none of which caused an accidental detonation of the explosive devices. There are other theories out there, one of which was prompted by Grissom's admission to Bob Thompson that he had removed the safety pin early. In the book, Gus Grissom, The Lost Astronaut, it describes how Thompson theorised that once the cover and safety pin were removed, no spring, just two O-rings held the plunger in place. The bobbing of the capsule in the water was so forceful that the plunger just slid in. This theory was dispelled by the post-flight testing that showed that this wasn't possible. A similar theory is described in Moonshot when it describes how a ring seal might have been omitted on the detonation plunger. In Gus Grissom, The Lost Astronaut, it describes how this may have caused the plunger to be triggered with a very little pressure. Again, post-flight vibration testing following the push tests on the plunger showed that this wasn't possible. Yet another theory that was considered was the possibility that seawater had caused a chemical reaction with the explosive charge causing it to be triggered. Once again, post-flight testing under similar conditions could not cause the detonation of the MDF. It has been suggested that Grissom hit the plunger accidentally by either putting on a life vest or by struggling with a life vest that he had inflated accidentally inside the cockpit. But Grissom had no life vest. If for whatever reason he found himself in the water, his spacesuit was supposed to provide the buoyancy required to keep him afloat. Finally, regarding theories, some people believe that some sort of electrical fault caused a short circuit in the emergency system causing the explosive to detonate. This is impossible because the emergency system was not connected to any kind of electrical circuit 
and was not operated electronically. The importance of having an emergency system not requiring electrical operation was demonstrated on Gordon Cooper's Mercury flight when he suffered an electrical failure. Of this he would later say, all of them went out, they were electronically connected, anything that had to do with electronics was gone. As shown in this example, there is one piece of evidence that is widely quoted to clear Grissom of any involvement in jettisoning the hatch on purpose. He had no cuts or bruises on his hand. On Mercury Atlas 6, Glenn had been recovered inside the spacecraft and had jettisoned the hatch on the deck of the recovery ship, the USS Noah. The June 1962 edition of the National Geographic magazine noted that he turns his head away from the door and with the back of his hand hits the firing pin. There is a loud report and he feels a momentary pain as the firing pin handle rebounds and cuts his knuckles. Glenn wrote in his book, the hatch's firing ring had kicked back and barked my knuckles, my only injury from my trip. The bandages covering Glenn's injuries can be seen in this photo taken on board the recovery ship, USS Noah, as he witnessed his fourth sunset of the day. To further clear the name of Grissom, Shearer did the same thing. He wrote in his book, Shearer's Space. I then jettisoned the hatch on purpose and the recoil of the plunger injured my hand. It actually caused a cut through a glove that was reinforced by metal. It proved he hadn't jettisoned the hatch with a hand, foot, knee or whatever, for he hadn't suffered even a minor bruise. I said, Gus, look at my hand, it really got hurt. <laughs> he knew exactly what I was telling him. The fact that Grissom had no visible injuries means that he couldn't have hit the plunger, right? Unfortunately, as with most things surrounding this mystery, even this seemingly indisputable evidence has had its waters muddied by Bob Thompson. In response to the claims made by Grissom's fellow astronauts that the lack of any injuries meant that he hadn't depressed the plunger, Thompson said, well, that's not necessarily true. Thompson stated, pushing that plunger in was kind of like shooting a shotgun. You can shoot a shotgun without getting beat up, or you can shoot it in such a way to get beat up. Thompson claimed that hitting the plunger with a knuckle like Glenn had done would have resulted in injury, but hit the plunger with the meaty part of your hand so that the recoil would hit there and there would be no injuries inflicted. It doesn't make sense that NASA would design a system that resulted in injuries, so Thompson's explanation does seem logical. Thompson not only introduced some doubt into the validity of this evidence, but he also hinted that it was the astronauts themselves who were at fault for any injuries inflicted. He said, The door always gave a little bit of a problem to the astronauts. The door worked fine. You just had to understand the system and use it properly. So this proof that is often regarded as cast iron does not 100% exonerate Grissom because according to Thompson, just like shooting a shotgun, there was a way of jettisoning the hatch without receiving any injuries. You just had to do it the right way. Following the mission of Mercury Redstone 4, the finger pointing for the loss of Liberty Bell 7 began. At the post-flight press conference, news reporters angling for a story jumped on the loss of the spacecraft. As Kraft wrote on the subject, the press roasted him and laid the blame squarely on his shoulders. Soon the newspaper reporters would have a new space story to write about. Just over two weeks after Grissom's flight, Soviet cosmonaut Titov was launched aboard Vostok 2 and spent over one day in orbit. The time for suborbital flights was over and NASA decided to send its next space pilot around the Earth. It was also decided that in the wake of Liberty Bell 7's loss, the safety devices on the explosive hatch wouldn't be prepared for opening until it was time to actually open it. On a lighter note, no future American spacecraft would ever be launched again with a crack painted on its side. According to the book For Spacious Skies, the loss of Liberty Bell 7 did benefit one person. It states that Kraft didn't like the power the astronauts wielded. The loss of a spacecraft by an astronaut led to lingering questions, which suited Kraft's purposes fine, because it made for more tractable astronauts all around. The controversy surrounding Grissom had perhaps reigned in the Mercury 7's power, and the next astronaut to run afoul of Kraft would feel his full wrath. The message was clear. The astronauts were no longer untouchable. Mess up and your career could be over something that Scott Carpenter found out the odd way. I understand the report came from Hawaii that it was a tired and confused astronaut. 
If my opinion is worth anything to you, this is not true. I will admit to being preoccupied. Unlike Carpenter, when it came to Grissom's performance, there was enough room for doubt that Kraft did nothing. He wrote on the subject. I listened, talked to Gus and read the reports. Then I chose to believe him. I trusted Grissom's professionalism and it was best for the programme. Grissom also had another important ally, Deke Slayton. Deke Slayton was officially announced as the coordinator of astronaut activities at the Manned Spacecraft Centre on the 18th of September 1962. Slayton later wrote, Gus Grissom was probably my best friend of all the astronauts. Grissom's NASA career rode the wave of controversy following his Mercury flight and with so many of the other Mercury astronauts yet to fly and the limited number of flights left in the program, Grissom moved over to Project Gemini. As Gordon Cooper noted, NASA never held the incident against him. In fact, they later gave him the first two-man Gemini flight and scheduled him for the first three-man Apollo mission. They would have done neither if they believed that Gus had panicked in any way. During the early days of Gemini, he made a real contribution at the McDonnell plant at St. Louis. So much so that the Gemini spacecraft became known as the Gusmobile. As commander of Gemini 3, Grissom wanted to name his spacecraft Molly Brown, after the lead from the Broadway musical The Unsinkable Molly Brown. NASA headquarters asked if he had a second choice name, to which Grissom said, Titanic. When Molly Brown splashed down, the attached parachute began dragging it, which caused Grissom's window to go under the water. He activated the release mechanism and the spacecraft righted itself, but in the swell it proved to be a nausea inducing weight for the crew and Grissom was sick. Despite being sick and the momentary concern of his window being submerged, Grissom did not panic, neither did he open the hatch and try to get out. After Gemini 3, Grissom was the backup commander for Gemini 6 before moving on to the ill-fated Apollo 1 mission and the irony of being killed because of a hatch that could not be opened. At the time of its loss, an expedition to recover the spacecraft was not considered worthwhile, as Bob Thompson revealed. I remember getting a TWX from the used tool company in Texas, saying that they had technology that would allow them to locate and recover the capsule. We wrote back, or I wrote back, and said, thanks but no thanks, the capsule is not worth that kind of expenditure on our part. We got really everything we needed from the flight without it. In 1999, an expedition did set out to find the lost spacecraft, although this move wasn't welcomed by everyone. Grissom's widow, Betty, said, It brings back memories and there's nothing good. It was a sentiment echoed by Grissom's backup for that flight, John Glenn, who thought it should have stayed in its resting place. Contrary to what Wolf wrote in his book, The Right Stuff. So he cuts the capsule loose. It drops and disappears forever. Nearly 38 years to the day after it sank, Liberty Bell 7 broke the surface of the ocean on the 20th of July, 1999. After being one of the last people to see the spacecraft before it sank in 1961, James Lewis, the pilot of the Prime Recovery Helicopter, was also one of the first to see it again from the deck of the recovery ship. As it resurfaced, he said, To see it come out of the water again, like it did that day long ago, was a feeling that I don't have an adjective to apply to. It was just amazing and very fulfilling. Betty Grissom wanted the spacecraft handed over to NASA so that they could inspect it and conduct a thorough investigation in order to discredit some of the rumours against her husband. Kurt Newport, the leader of the recovery expedition said, it makes no difference to me why it sank. It's not my intention to drag up that controversy. Instead he hoped recovering the spacecraft would direct attention to Grissom's numerous contributions to America's space programme. Liberty Bell 7 was restored and put on display, but its recovery did not answer the question of what happened that July day back in 1961. When I first started to learn about this particular incident, it was in the pre-internet age. The few books I had access to stated that the experts had not been able to make the hatch blow by accident, and the film The Right Stuff presented a very derogatory impression of Grissom. I did not do anything wrong! The hatch just blew! It was a glitch! It was a... A technical malfunction! Why in hell would anyone believe me? <laughs> Fortunately, we now live in the internet age, and anyone coming to this subject afresh has access to a much wider range of the most up-to-date evidence. So hopefully the pendulum of didi didn't will swing conclusively 
Two, he did not panic and he did not jettison the hatch, either on purpose or by accident. It's just a shame that however far we come towards totally clearing Grissom's name of any involvement in this incident, that one particular film will unfortunately always drag his reputation back down. Maybe we should all remember who really had the right stuff. As Gene Kranz wrote in his book, Failure is not an option. Everything I had seen of Gus and the astronauts indicated that they had the right stuff. The final word should go to United States Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Virgil Ivan Gus Grissom, the first man to go into space twice. Grissom once said of the loss of Liberty Bell 7, it remained a mystery how that hatch blew, and I am afraid it always will. It was just one of those things. If you have found this series of videos informative, then make sure to subscribe for future videos and thanks for watching.